and uh, just wanted to uh, thank uh, all the uh, comrades and friends who are here today for all the work you do for Workers World Party and for its mass work. I also want to uh, commend uh, Comrade uh, Larry Hales uh, for setting up this meeting today. He called me about six weeks ago and wanted to know would I be interested in coming to New York, of course, and to talk about Kwame Nkrumah, certainly. <laughs> And also Comrade Deirdre Griswold for the excellent job that she has done and continues to do uh, as the editor-in-chief of Workers World newspaper. I just wanted to mention also uh, that um, the comrades in Detroit uh, send you their revolutionary greetings. Uh, later on this month we're going to bring out uh, Comrade uh, Sarah Flounders who's going to talk about the developing situation in Syria which is very dangerous. They're utilizing a very similar playbook that they've utilized many times before in the modern period, uh, be it in Iraq uh, during the early 1990s, uh, be it in other places, Afghanistan, of course, Iraq again, and then, of course, Libya last year, and now Syria uh, as a gateway to Iran, as a gateway to southern Lebanon uh, against Hezbollah, and also to intensify the imprisonment and uh, repression of the Palestinian people of Gaza and throughout the length and breadth of Palestine. So, as usual, we are totally and categorically opposed to any U.S. imperialist intervention anywhere in the world. And that's why we have come out in solid defense of the people of Syria and the people of the entire Middle East. Uh, they need our support. Uh, we're very clear that we're not going to take any position or do anything that's going to strengthen imperialism. The struggle against imperialism in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, in the Caribbean, of course strengthens our struggle here in the United States against capitalism and imperialism here in North America. The talk that uh, Comrade Deirdre gave was very important. As she mentioned, uh, Ethiopia and other revolutionary movements in Africa are largely hidden, uh, not only from the public view, but also within academic circles itself. Being a university student uh, during the late 1970s, uh, there was, and I was studying political science at the time and economics, none of the uh, academics, uh, even at Wayne State University, which is a working class campus, even discussed uh, Ethiopia and its significance. We have to rely on our own resources to do the research, to do the travel, to do the analysis, to bring the truth uh, to the people. And this is what we do through Workers World newspaper, through our public meetings, and of course through the Marxist School, which is a very important development uh, that is being advanced right now uh, by Workers World Party. We are committed to Marxist Leninist education, study, and analysis. We publish a newspaper every week. Uh, we are committed uh, to the education and the consciousness of the working class and the oppressed. We have not abandoned the ideological struggle. In fact, during this period of economic crisis, we recognize the importance of ideology in the overall struggle to build a revolutionary movement. It is important, it is very much needed. This uh, day today is very important historically because uh, some 36 years ago we had the initiation of the National Student Uprising in South Africa that began in Soweto in 1976. <laughs> this came out of the same period as the Ethiopian Revolution, as the escalation of the armed struggle uh, throughout uh, the entire region of Southern Africa. And of course, the struggle uh, that came out of South Africa had a tremendous impact on the African continent as a whole, and also uh, in regard to the anti-racist struggle here in this country. Uh, it re-energized the struggle for black liberation here in the United States. Because what we saw just a decade after the civil rights and black power movements and the rebellions that rocked the cities here in the United States we saw a similar situation in South Africa, where young people uh, went out into the streets facing guns, tanks, facing a state that was financed and assisted and advised and programmed, in fact, by U.S. imperialism. 
They armed the racist South African regime. They provided political and ideological cover for the racist South African regime. And it is a testament to the heroic character of the African people and to humanity in general that the masses were able to organize, mobilize, rise up, and in fact defeat the uh, settler colonial regime in South Africa. This is a monumental contribution to humanity. And of course, Workers' World Party played a tremendous role in that struggle here in this country taking a very clear position in support of the African National Congress, the Southwest Africa People's Organization of Namibia, the MPLA of Angola, supporting the Cuban internationalist forces that went into Angola in 1975 and stayed there for some 13 years to work in solidarity with the peoples of Angola and Namibia and South Africa to defeat the racist South African Defense Forces, who many people said could not be defeated in Southern Africa. They were defeated. And this is a monumental contribution to humanity. Also, I want to mention before I get into this uh, presentation, both Ethiopia as well as Ghana have a long and proud tradition. Ethiopia, in regard to human civilization, goes all the way back at least uh, to the third and fourth century, what they call AD. Many of the institutions that you see in Ethiopia, for example, the early uh, Christian church uh, built monumental structures, um, very sophisticated uh, societal uh, systems uh, that still have an impact on that society today. Even in ancient mythology, even in the Christian religion itself, with the Islamic tradition as well, Ethiopia has played a tremendous part in that legacy. As Deirdre mentioned, uh, it was a country that resisted European colonialism for many, many years. In 1896, there was an invasion by the Italian colonialists who attempted to subdue Ethiopia, and they were fought uh, by Menelik. Uh, although they did take over Eritrea, and they did take over uh, the, uh, what became known as Italian Somaliland, they were not able to take over most of the territory of Ethiopia. Then, of course, in 1935, uh, which many uh, Pan-Africanists uh, date as the beginning of the Second World War as opposed to uh, 1939, the Italian fascists under Mussolini invaded Abyssinia. And people were slaughtered in the thousands. They used mustard gas. Uh, against the uh, Ethiopian people. The emperor was forced uh, to flee uh, to Europe. But the Italian invasion of Abyssinia woke up uh, black people and the progressive people throughout the world. Even here in New York City, uh, there was rebellions that took place in support of the Ethiopian people. There were thousands of people who came forward to volunteer to go and fight in Ethiopia against Italian fascism. So it electrified the movement, the anti-imperialist movement. In Britain, uh, people like George Padmore, C.L.R. James, who were Marxists um, from the Caribbean, uh, were heavily involved in doing support work on behalf of the masses in Ethiopia. In Ghana, for example, as well, the traditional Ghanaian society goes back just as far as uh, Ethiopia to the fourth, fifth century AD. And there were other successive African civilizations that came after Ghana. We could talk about the Mali civilization and of course the civilization of Songhai. And these were large uh, civilizations that not only built internally but also had contacts with people throughout the region as well as people throughout uh, the Middle East and as far away as Europe and Asia as well. So we're talking about societies that have centuries long traditions of culture and historical development. With specific reference to modern day Ghana, which was named by the British as the Gold Coast because it was so rich in gold, Ghana, uh, of course, fell victim to the Atlantic slave trade, later fell victim to colonialism, but the people there always resisted. It took centuries uh, for the Europeans to establish a firm foothold uh, in what, what was known then as the Gold Coast. Just one example of the anti-colonial struggle was the uh, Ashanti people during the turn of the 19th and 20th century under an uh, African woman, Queen Asantiwa, who
who organized a military campaign against British imperialism and fought several wars against the British before they were forced to subdue uh, to British imperialism after 1901. There were other organizations uh, as well. The Aboriginal uh, Protection Society was another organization, the Fonte uh, Confederation uh, that rose up during the latter part of the 19th century. Then of course later there became the um, the uh, Congress of British West Africa, uh, which of course was inspired by the uh, Pan-African movement uh, that was initiated by people like W.B. Du Bois and uh, Henry Sylvester Williams, Anna Julia Cooper, uh, and others. Uh, we're talking about the early part of the 20th century. Now Kwame Nkrumah, of course, was a personality, but he did not exist in a vacuum. He came out of this struggle against colonialism, against imperialism. Now Kwame Nkrumah, of course, was a tireless organizer for the African Revolution. The revolution that swept the African continent and the African diaspora between the post-World War II period through the, the early 1970s. And Krumah passed in 1972. In fact, this year, we commemorate the 40th anniversary of his transition. In fact, uh, there was an article uh, just recently in Workers' World newspaper paying tribute uh, to Kwame Nkrumah. A major source for spreading of his ideas was directly related to his literary influence. Now, going back at least to his student days in the United States, he went to college here in the United States, Lincoln University in Pennsylvania, and also the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And Krumah wrote for several publications. He also lectured broadly within the African student and the broader African American community. This is in the, he came here in 1935 and he stayed for 10 years to 1945. So we're talking about the period of the Great Depression and World War II that Kwame Nkrumah was here in the United States. And Nkrumah was a co-founder of the African Students Association, one of the first African student organizations in the United States. It also had a, a, a counterpart in Canada and reportedly worked with other organizations, including the uh, Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, which had a strong base in Philadelphia. And I've heard, you know, 30 years ago, some of the older UNIA people talk about uh, Nkrumah when he was uh, active with them during the 30s and 40s. He also worked with the Council on African Affairs, which was led by Dr. W.B. Du Bois uh, and Dr. Alphaeus Hunton, as well as Paul Robeson. Du Bois, of course, was a um, co-founder of the Pan-African Movement. He wrote extensively on African affairs, African-American affairs. It was attributed with the formation of the field of sociology here in the United States during uh, 